Hello, this is um, Christian Idealism. So today I have a different guest. His name is Cam, and he's a he's an, he calls himself an atheistic naturalist because um, I you know you're not a theist. You're actually an atheist. So you know we would have different views on philosophy. But I wanted to come here and kind of dialogue with you about certain topics like you know philosophy of mind, philosophy of religion, um, stuff like that. Um, so just tell me like what's your before we kind of start, like, what's your perspective? Like, what's your view of reality? Um, what's your, you know? <laughs> That's sorry. a big question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what do you um, think is, you know? So my background a little bit. Um, so I'm, I'm not an expert in any of these subjects that we're about to discuss. I don't have a PhD or an advanced degree in any of it. So take whatever I say with a big grain of salt. <laughs> um, so my general position, it's not one of uh, kind of like a dogmatic commitment to any particular ontology. I, um, I think it's most plausible that uh, natural uh, reality exhausts causal reality. Um, so that leaves me open to thinking that there might be non-natural things, provided that they're not causal or not part of causal reality. So it's a kind of a position similar to Graham Olpe. Um, but it's also not one that I like particularly go to the mat for either, because right. I'm um, I'm kind of of the, of the position that when we, when we move past um, the uh, sciences, we find a lot of difficulty in gaining epistemic access to what is true. And um, it means that we are rather in the realm of sort of uh, honed speculation and comparative analysis of things like explanatory virtues and what coheres with perhaps like our intuitions. Um, and that means that I'm in a position where I don't really take any strong on like position on metaphysics and ontology, but I do have what I think is a more plausible account, which is what I described before. Okay. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way, even though I'm a Christian, I don't really, like, I'm very open-minded. Like, I'm, I'm always, I'm not the type of Christian that's going to, you know, say that you're a, the devil if you disagree with me or, you know, <laughs> whatever. Um, so I'm very open-minded toward, you know, changing my views on things. Um, and that's, you know, I think everybody should be like that. And I, I have a feeling that like, you know, for me, I don't, I'm, I'm very open-minded, but I'm also against other views, which mainly is views that um, try to make absolute claims about reality. So this includes both um, religious people and non-religious people, right? So for me, like, I, I don't, like, I respect people like Graham Oppy, for example, what I don't respect is people like Aaron Raw that are very dogmatic about, you know, their positions. So when it comes to dogmatism, I'm very much against dogmatism, regardless of whether or not it's religious or non-religious dogmatism. Um, so that's why I kind of have to be careful in how I evaluate my beliefs because, you know, I'm biased as well. We're all biased, right? Um, so, and again, there, there obviously are also you know, cultural influences that have influenced my beliefs as well. So I have to take that into account. Um, and so, again, you just have to be open-minded. And when it comes to epistemology, I'm more of a Bayesian. So I'm sure you're familiar with that, which is basically like all beliefs are probabilistic, right? So I wouldn't be a presuppositionalist that's going to say that we can know for absolute certainty whether God exists or whether he doesn't exist, right? It's always going to be a probable claim because that's what most claims are almost every single belief we have is going to be you know probable in nature um it, there's never really a, a i don't think there's any beliefs i have that i can say that i can know for absolute certainty now there can be certain beliefs that i know are not true like i know that square circles don't exist um i know that santa claus doesn't exist right so there are certain things that i could be you know more against but when it comes to like whether or not beliefs things are true, it's very hard for me to say other than, you know, my own existence, if I can know whether or not, you know, something is true or something is the case. Um, and so, and so, yeah, that's kind of my view. And that's why, you know, when it comes to 
applying just knowledge to all fields, again, I think all fields kind of follow that same route where everything's probabilistic. Science is probabilistic. History is probabilistic. Almost any field of study is going to be probabilistic. Um, and so I don't, I don't like to view science as the only way of truth, right? I also view history as a way of knowing about the past. And um, so there's a lot of different methods one can use to reach truth. And so one is not above the other in any sense. But, uh, but yeah, what do you think? I mean, what's your position on, on epistemology in general? So if I was to adopt um, the Bayesian perspective you were talking about there um, and make a comment about what I see um, uh, that distinguishes the sciences from some other areas is the um, the strength or like the magnitude of what Bayesians call a Bayes factor, which is like the ratio of consequent probabilities, that kind of thing. Um, well, to give a bit more of a layman's description so people can follow along. Um, it's when you have one theory and it predict, predict, predicts some particular data with a particular strength, and then you put that in ratio with another theory or hypothesis that predicts the same data, um, and you can, by using a ratio, you compare their magnitudes. And so um, the distinction between like some particular areas like history and perhaps like the hard sciences or the biological sciences um, is that you can get really large Bayes factors when you have precise models that make precise predictions about what you will observe in particular circumstances. And that's in comparison with uh, plate or like epistemic fields or fields where you have smaller base factors. That is, you have strength of evidence, which is lower. So like the idea here is that within a Bayesian framework, um, you can say in physics have a model that predicts with a very high degree of confidence, that is a high consequent probability, that you will see some particular thing at some particular time given some certain conditions. And um, this is in contrast with maybe a field like history, where the types of consequent probabilities that you're talking about are not so high in relation to each other. You might have many models that predict the same data with like almost equally ex uh, explanatory virtues or prior probabilities would be one way to catch that out. Um, so I do see a distinction between different fields. Um, I think that they can all be modeled within the same Bayesian epistemic framework as you talk about. Right. Um, but I wouldn't try to make the claim that they're on a par with one another because there is this distinction I can draw between them. And the distinction comes, I think, most strongly from that part that I was referring to. From the to hard earlier. sciences, right? Well, yeah, from the hard sciences, but the characteristic of the hard sciences is that they actually put forth precise models that give precise predictions. So when they sit in competition with other models that don't give such precise predictions, um, they tend to fare really well um, in the Bayesian anal analysis. Um, so, yeah, but I'm in agreement with you that I think that like uh, the sciences, for example, are not like the only way to come to heightened or uh, increased degrees of credence in propositions. Um, in everyday life, like when I, for example, um, you know, think about just propositions about my own family or think about propositions about something to do with my work, it's quite clear that I'm not using the methods of science. I'm not um, making uh, testable predictions and then repeating um, experiments or data collecting in some formal fashion. I'm not describing my methodology ahead of time and, <laughs> you know, et cetera. Right. But, but instead, like I am, um, you know, I have a model about the world in my brain and I have competitive models and I make judgments between them based upon how much they cohere or fit with the data um, that I'm observing. And all of that process, in my view, happens for the most part um, unconsciously or like it doesn't happen by virtue of like uh, explicit reasoning that we carry out in our um, in our like 
propositionally in our minds. Like we don't, for example, get up pieces of paper and write down our credences and then give Bayes factors and <laughs> et cetera. Well, no. Um, it just doesn't really work like that. But but still, um, I do think I try in my personal life to have um, uh, – I do try to model my credences um, with, like, the probability theory calculus. But Okay. You know, no, yeah, I, I would achieve that. <laughs> well, like just a, a tangential note there is that like folks like Tana, uh, Kahneman and Tversky have shown that at least for um, most reasoners, and I think probably all reasoners, we have certain cognitive biases that um, demonstrate ways in which we deviate from the probability calculus. Right. Well, I mean, I would agree with you that are you, are you basically saying that we using Bayes theorem, we can't, even if you can't, even if you can't mathematically write it out in a piece of paper, you're still using it subconsciously, like in your mind when you're reasoning. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, kind of like okay. uh, the way that I, the way that I see it is, um, I think that from probability theory and Bayesian reasoning, you can draw these general um, sort of principles and you can follow those because they can become more, uh, they can become an intuitive part of your reasoning. Like maybe I can give an example. Um, like, one sort of principle that comes out of Bayesian reasoning is that. And it's found elsewhere in epistemology too, so I'm not trying to pretend right. it's unique. But, but it, it's this um, this idea that when you take a theory um, and you're given some data and it doesn't predict that data very well, um, that you can make adjustments to your theory to make it so it better fits that data. Um, a, some kind of or a conclusion from Bayesian reasoning is that by doing so, you um, lower the intrinsic probability of your theory by the addition of this like auxiliary hypothesis. So when you find, for example, that you're making the claim that I see a, a dragon in my garage, or there's a dragon in my garage and then somebody walks along and they say, oh, well, you know, I, I can't see it. And the person says, oh, it's an invisible dragon. Um, and then they say, oh, okay, well, maybe I'll throw some flour up in the air and I'll see if, uh, if it makes some footprints and uh, makes an outline. Oh, it's an impermeable dragon, et cetera. Um, so like, or another example about what um, Bayesian reasoning teaches you is that you want to, um, uh the the hypothesis or theory that best predicts the observation is the one that gets most epistemic weight um or like has the most evidence given for for that particular observation um or th there are other things as well um but anyway maybe we should right. move on to it yeah um so yeah i think i think we can both agree with that um and then so when it comes to that, I feel like when it comes to, I mean, I mean, obviously religion is definitely Not for me, unfortunately. Sorry. <laughs> so religion is very, um, like people get very like, Ooh, I can't talk about that. Cause you know, it'll hurt my feelings or whatever. Um, and I feel like, I feel like it's best if you model, if you want to like figure out which at least not religion is true per se, but which one's more probable. Um, you kind of have to, look at it as a model of certain events and or both in history and how the nature of reality works. So like, for example, if we, t if we say that naturalism is true, then obviously none of the religious models are going to work because it has something in there that is not in naturalism per se. And then if you have another metaphysical, metaphysical theory like dualism, then maybe it could work, but maybe, maybe it's not as good because even though it does grant non-physical minds or disembodied minds, um, that doesn't mean that therefore any religion is true. It just means that, you know, the probability of them goes a little up. Um, and so for me personally, um, like I take an idealist position. So I think that, you know, obviously I think Christianity is the most probable, but of course I don't, I don't claim to, cl I don't really say that it's true in the sense of, I know it's true. I just say that it's, I think it's the case. I think it's most probably the case. Again, I could be wrong. 
<laughs> so I could be very wrong in my beliefs about Christianity. Um, turns out, you know, Christianity could be false, but then, you know, God still exists, even if it's not, you know, the Christian God per se. Right. And so I think people need to be careful. Like when people say that, um, like when people, when you grant them that a soul exists, they'll say, oh, well, then therefore Christianity is true. It's like, no, that's not a very valid like you need to make an inference, right? You can't you can't just say God exists and then go from there to say that one particular religion is true because that is a very big um like gap. That's a very like very long way. So even if even if you grant the theists that God exists, that's not granting them their God that they want to exist. And so from there I think you know you kind of have to go to the historical claims of what they're what they're saying um i mean what what, would you agree with that like there's a i i I think we would agree that like there's a very big gap i think most christians don't realize like there's this really huge gap between theism and christian theism that people seem to not understand that well yeah um i do agree with that um the like one way of kind of capturing my thoughts on it is that like in the same manner in which when we discuss things for example the fine-tuning argument and what we're talking about is how like particular physical models exist within this large space of possible physical models um and the you know the problem is like what is it that picks out the particular physical model that describes our universe um and uh therefore like constrains or makes the um consequent probability that we would observe life high um so we're not left with this problem where we have um something left to be explained now in the same vogue i think theism um has a space of possible theistic models now i I would conjecture that a difficulty for theism and for theists to face is the preciseness of those models. But um, uh, like one way of sort of cashing it out is that it's uh, if you think that God is a being that has intentions, then um, you have opened up the space of possible theistic models to be those uh, uh, the space of possible intentions. Um, and I think that intuitively when thinking about gods, people uh, really narrow in on a really specific specific subspace of the theistic model space, which is um, like the, the gods that have positive intentions towards humans or uh, the gods that have intentions that relate to, um, you know, moral dis- properties or you know th- this type right. of thing um it's it's hard to get exactly precise with what i'm trying to express but anyway i think you get the general point <laughs> and so yeah i do think that like theism is really broad um i think sometimes it's it's thought to be really narrow but it's really not um and i think that we get quite a lot of bias from our theistic traditions um about what what the possible models are um oh. and so when people think about gods they have a tendency to think about the gods that they were raised with or the gods that they came into like the concepts of gods they came into or they encountered during their upbringing or perhaps even in their adult life and um i do love the fact that people such as yourself are considering much broader theistic models i like that it's I think well, it, right um, even even within like for example um one of my favorite philosophers bernardo kastrup he's not a christian but he does um acknowledge the fact that his he has like his own model of god per se it's like an impersonal being but he does he does acknowledge that like technically speaking you could have christianity could be true even if this god exists right um, I guess you we would just have to say that like the universal wave function or not the sorry, the universal consciousness or his God would kind of like um, personalize itself into a thing, which would be Jesus. Right. So 
again, it, you could say it's ad hoc, right? You could always say like, oh, that violates Oxen's razor. There's no reason to assume that. But again, it does work, right? So that's why for me, I'm I'm more open toward, you know, different ideas of what God is. I don't really have a problem with saying that God is this impersonal force in nature or, you know, I probably would be a Christian if that were the case, but because um, I have to take into account that, yes, you know, the Christian God is a personal deity, right? He does care about humans. So in that sense, you know, I kind of have to grant just for, you know, religious purposes that God is personal. But again, I don't have, to, you know, that's why I, I have to be very careful because when I say I'm a Christian, I have to be, I'm an open-minded Christian. So I have to be open to things like process theology or open theism or things that have been considered heresies by the church, right? So for me, I don't really care whether or not something is called a heresy. I just care whether or not it's true, whether or not it could be applied toward, you know, my religion or whatever. Um, and I think that's kind of why most people have this very hard time, you know, taking my kind of position on it because, you know, you've had Christians throughout history that have said, oh, that's heretical, right? You're like You've had councils of church authorities that have said, oh, well, we can't accept this version of God because, you know, it's against this belief or whatever. And to me, I'm just like, who cares? Like, it doesn't matter, you know? Um, so, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, do you think that Christians, and not just Christians, but like any religious people should be more open-minded towards other models of God that don't necessarily fit with how Christians throughout history have modeled God? I mean, what do you, what do you think about that? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's hard to take a position on what right, people should right. do and stuff like that, but, um, I know that my own curiosity has um, inclined me towards considering many different theistic Christian models. So, um, like, I guess as an example of this, when I was a Christian, um, I wasn't a Christian in the way that a lot of people would think. Like, for example, I didn't believe in hell. Um, I couldn't reconcile the idea of a loving uh, creator and the concept of hell, at least the one presented to me as a kid. Right. Um, and um, I also, like, there were many elements of the Gospels that even as a Christian, I didn't think were very likely. Um, and I, um, yeah, so I mean, I, I wasn't a very typical Christian even. And by the way, I wasn't a Christian for a very long time. I was right. raised as a Christian, but like my parents were, um, they were very loose about it. They sent me to Sunday school with my aunties um, and I so imbibed a variety of uh, Christian ideas from my right. extended family. Um, my grandparents um, and aunties were highly religious, um, uh, kind of more on the sort of charismatic Pentecostal variety. Um, but my parents weren't. And so um, in the family home, I didn't really get exposed to it directly from them. I didn't get told what I had to believe. Um, but I converted when I was 16 and then sort of like fell away, like backslid and sort of thing. And then again, when I was about 19 um, and both of those times had only lasted for about a year. So I think a lot of people wouldn't even really consider me a Christian, but I did believe that Jesus was res resurrected. So I don't know if that counts for right. anything. <laughs> well, um, here's, and yeah, I obviously that's... believed in God. Yeah. Well, for me, I mean, I feel like there, there has to be some necessary conditions, right? So like to be a Christian, you have to accept that Jesus rose from the dead. You have to accept that God is personal. And then you also, I think basically the only three things would be, you have to accept that Jesus rose from the dead. You have to accept that God is personal and you have to accept that, you know, Jesus is responsible for your salvation. So I think those three things are kind of the necessary criteria for you to be a Christian. And then the other views, like, you know, your view on hell or, you know, the exact model of how you think of God, I think could be, you know, it can be somewhat flexible depending on um, how you do it. But, so, but yeah. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't 
I don't know how to define like that seems like the essentials to me but I mean people have very different opinions on that all right um but i'm i'm with you that i do think it's worthwhile i think people should be curious about other theistic models um and i think that they should be uh they should follow their own light of reason so to speak when dealing with theological problems or uh problems of you know history and what history tells us about um about the bible and things like that so i think people should um i come from like a sort of skeptical free thinker kind of background a bit like when i was um about 20 i got into that skeptic scene and so they're really big on just like considering um you know alternate ideas and obviously using evidence to adjudicate between them but um yeah so i i would encourage that but that's kind of anathema to some forms of christianity so i know there's a lot of people that don't really like that idea yeah yeah i i know trust me i mean i've i've been researching catholicism and there's there's these things they're called catholic dogmas and a lot of them are a set of beliefs that you have to accept as a catholic right so these include like um, the perpetual virgin virginity of Mary or that the idea was Mary was sinless or um, I think, yeah, purgatory as well. And then also that um, the bread and wine are literally the blood of Christ, at least metaphysically speaking. So I don't know. Again, you have to, I've been trying to understand like how that works from a metaphysical perspective, but I guess there's, there's like a Thomistic way yeah, how that how it's it works couched but... within, commonly couched within like some uh thomistic framework so or metaphysics so yeah and i um, don't think that they're quite meaning what people think they mean by saying that they are the same um but yeah i mean i would i i'd happy to turn be happy to turn towards um the like discussing the gospels or historical method um okay. and like how you apply Bayes bayesian reasoning to questions of history or towards like idealism specifically or quantum mechanics that type of stuff um whatever you're up for okay so i don't actually we'll start off with the history because that's kind of like um i don't i don't i'm not really big on that so for me i take i actually don't accept the minimal facts so i just want to be myself clear um i've tried to defend it the best I can, but I can't do it. Even from a Christian, even from you know someone like me that can be considered biased toward Christianity, I, I I have it's very hard for me to be honest while also defending the minimal facts. And I think the reason why is um, you can explain those facts, at least the minimal facts, without implying the resurrection. Um, and it, it's very simple how you do it. So basically what you do is you say that Jesus was an apocalyptic teacher, right? So that would mean that his predictions about the future or his prophecy of, because people, because a common argument from Christians when it comes to um, the historicity of the resurrection, they'll say, oh, well, Jesus predicted that he'll rise again from the, from the dead. Well, not really. If you kind of interpret what he's saying in terms of apocalyptic imagery where because he's, you know, because he's an apocalyptic, you know, prophet, then he's not predicting his own resurrection. Rather, he's predicting the resurrection of the church itself. So something that happens in the far future. So he's not predicting his death per se. He's predicting, you know, the death and the resurrection of the general church in the far future. So, you know, that doesn't really work um, from a minimal facts perspective. And then when it comes to the empty tomb, um, you could explain that in terms of um, the tomb was empty, but someone stole the body. And the reason why they weren't able to find the body was precisely because, well, it was stolen. So that's why the Jews weren't able to grab it and pull it somewhere else. And then I think there's, oh, yeah, and the crucifixion. Well, that's pretty self-explanatory. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think at least when it comes to minimal facts, I don't like it because it, it doesn't really make the full case the best at least not the best christian case that one can make and so 
for me, I go for a maximal fact approach, which is basically just arguing from New Testament reliability. And I have a book, it's called um, The Jesus Legend. I don't know if you have it. It's really good. Um, and what it is does- by uh, Boyd? Yeah, Katie yeah. Boyd? Yeah, yeah, I've got that. So that book pretty much is like my fourth runner when it comes to at least, you know, general gospel reliability, right? So it's not necessarily arguing for the resurrection per se, but uh, it's arguing basically that the, the oral traditions behind the gospels are generally reliable. And then from there, I, you know, present a, you know, or I hold to a maximal case approach to the resurrection specifically. Um, so that's kind of how, how I view it from now, you know, what's, what's your perspective on that? Hmm. Um, so yeah, with respect to minimal facts, I mean, it's important to talk about like what specifically, what minimal, minimal facts you're talking about. Cause like Lycona and Habermas at different points in debates and in books have used different sets of minimal facts uh, while William Lane Craig states that he doesn't use the minimal facts approach at least in his debate presentations and in um, parts of his books he does use like a limited set of facts um, so it's important to, to, to talk about like what precisely they are um, but in general um, what I sorry, what I mean there is that there isn't one set of minimal facts. There has been different sets of minimal facts used by the same authors, and in different contexts. Um, and uh, like so, for example, you mentioned the empty tomb, but my understanding is that currently um, Gary Habermas doesn't actually use that as one of his minimal facts in his modern presentation well, right, of today. the argument because my understanding is that he um, has shifted somewhat in his analysis of what percentage of scholars accept the empty tomb. Um, uh, yeah, it's good to talk about the criteria that Habermas uses for the very um, strict criteria. Something. So I grant, you know, it's a pretty good criteria. Um, it's pretty strict, very strict. But but yeah, I understand what you're saying. Definitely, the empty tomb is not. It doesn't meet the same criteria as the other facts. So yeah, well, I mean, on that one in particular, like there is a lot of confusion, I think, publicly about what the claim is specifically about the scholarly community. Um, you've heard, for example, probably that 75% of uh, published scholars yeah, uh, on the I, term. For me, I don't, I, I don't, right. I don't really like to use that argument because um, like, again, if I'm trying to be honest, that isn't really, that doesn't really sample you know, all scholars in the field, right? So the actual number of scholars that accept it, we don't really know. That's kind of what I think. We have no idea. So Right. And why I, I was trying to make that point because that isn't even the claim that Gary Habermas makes. And I'll see if I can get it correct. The claim is actually that 70 to 75% of those who have published either positively or negatively accept one or more of a set of arguments positively in favor of an empty term. So the claim is actually very nuanced and it's not what um, I think most people glean from the right, presentation right. see usually about it. Um, and obviously like when you start getting into the specifics of that, you can see the methodological problems that it has because it excludes um, those people who think that our available evidence doesn't um, uh, tell us one way or the other. Um, right, it, so it so, excludes people but, that are neutral on the position, basically. That's right. And it's okay. also sample, sampling from a, um, a set of literature we think um, ha we, we have a pretty reasonable case to be made has, would have a sampling bias um, or a selection bias. The other aspect is that uh, William Lane Craig, uh, sorry, Gary Habermas's um, 70 to 75 percent includes non-expert scholars as well. It's actually writers who have published either positively or negatively on the subject. So it includes 
non-historians like Richard Swinburne, for example. Oh, um, okay. Now that, okay. Which that is something sense. that a lot of people don't realize. And part of the difficulty with this is that Gary Habermas hasn't actually published the sources that he draws the, the sorry, the statistics from. Um, uh, but m more broadly, like you point out with the comment on maximal facts, like I do think that it's invalid epistemically to consider a li limited set of information in analysis of hypotheses. So I think that like an ep epistemic norm that I adhere to is that um, uh, all information bearing on a hypothesis needs to be incorporated in the analysis. So I don't think that we can restrict ourselves to a minimal set or a limited set. Right, because we don't. Facts. Right, because we don't really do that in other fields. If you think about it, like we don't, you know, when we're trying to come up with the best explanation, we don't just use only, you know, minimal facts. Right, we try to encompass all the facts. Right, so I think that's why maximal facts is yeah, definitely and much better. So. An example of this, which I think helps to reveal how, at least in the published literature by Lycona, Habermas, and Craig, the account of what constitutes the best explanation of even the minimal facts suggested, um, the, um, the ascension is an example. So if we consider one more minimal fact to be added, um, it, it's that uh, out of both theistic and non-theistic Christian and non-Christian scholars, um, almost everybody agrees that around a month after Jesus' death, he was absent bodily on earth and inactive bodily on earth. So the reason for, I mean, there's a variety of reasons why people think this, but uh, generally the argument is that we have a lot of data in Acts and a lot of data in the Pauline epistles that suggest that around a month after Jesus's crucifixion, he wasn't alive and bodily active on earth. Now, the the way in which this is explained is actually different on different people's uh, claims about history. So for the non-Christian um, historians, they think that this is explained by the fact that Jesus died and remained dead. Um, right. You know, and it's a it's a generalization from uh, our understanding of biology that when people die, they're not alive bodily on Earth. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, subsequent to that. Well, right. That uh, makes sense. Pretty obvious. It, feels like right. it, it doesn't really need pointing out. But like on the um, the the more sort of Christian end of the hypothesis space, um, it's it's usually thought that Jesus from the account of Acts 1 verse 9, and also I think Luke 24, um, that Jesus ascended in some fashion, however that exactly happened, to heaven. So he went up and it was observed by, you know, some disciples that he ascended to some place up in the sky, or maybe that right. was metaphorical or something like that, I don't know. But the point here is that there are um, the minimal resurrection hypothesis that is the one that uh makes the claim that jesus after death arose right. bodily on earth doesn't actually make the prediction that jesus would fly up to heaven you know it's compatible with jesus walking around and remaining on earth and continuing to teach people or bringing about a you know a powerful kingdom on earth direct in the physical presence after his resurrection um it's compatible with many different it, it's compatible with the claim that he went off to <laughs> the united states and um right know, talk to some people uh, it's compatible with many different things and um so at least the minimal resurrection hypothesis has to be um uh, put in conjunction with the claim that Jesus, after his death, around 30 days later, ascended into heaven or disappeared physically from earth in such a way that he wasn't alive and bodily active. Um, so that's like one way in which I think like the minimal facts case doesn't quite 
do right because there's more the that needs to be explained needed but basically is that so basically yeah. there needs to be more of an explanation rather than just the resurrection right is that what you're saying yeah i i okay. think there's minimal facts that right um okay. so like if we adopt the paradigm of habermas um then i think that there are other minimal facts that he doesn't include that are agreed upon by all historians that the resurrection hypothesis alone without being conjoined to a ascension hypothesis doesn't explain and so okay. it, it actually uh, affects our um it in two in two fashions it affects our account of the explanatory virtues of the hypothesis one it affects the explanatory scope and power of the hypothesis because it's been observed that there is data that the resurrection hypothesis doesn't explain that is where's jesus um you know where was jesus right. after after his right. resurrection and then um, it also is affected in its ad hocness because, um, and this is a trade off, by the way, because if you adopt the ascension hypothesis in conjunction with the claim that Jesus resurrected, then you are lowering the intrinsic plausibility or probability of the theory because now you have two claims one that Jesus um, ascended and the other that Jesus resurrected. Okay. Well, I mean, when it comes to ascension, um, I guess the evidence for that would just simply just be the eyewitness accounts, which, again, you can kind of argue against. But, I mean, I, I guess you could, I mean, speaking from the Christian perspective, I guess you could say, even if, you know, not taking into account prior probability, but, but just the historical evidence, just say, like, oh, there were eyewitnesses that saw Jesus ascend. Um, so I guess you could, that would kind of, so you basically have to adopt both of them because it seems like the evidence would support both theories. Um, at least that's what what I would think. Yeah. So I mean that's kind of like blending two different approaches. Right. But, right. Yeah. Because that's obviously not something that's agreed upon by a consensus of historians. Um, right. And maybe this is a good turning point that maybe you and I could talk about what our positions are on the gospel and acts literature. So. Are you of the, um, well, first of all, maybe a good place to start is uh, the literary literary relationships between the Gospels. So take, for example, the Synoptics and John. Um, what is your position on the Synoptic problem? Um, I think Mark was most likely first, though. I mean, there are some papers that argue against that. So, But I think it's, at least right now, it seems to be the case that Mark was first and then later oral traditions kind of formed the uh, other gospels like Matthew, Luke, and John. Um, so again, I think it was mostly, I think my, my basic, cause I mean, this also gets into like the genre of the gospels, right? So for me, I, I just, I take it all as just basically the genre of the gospels is basically all oral traditions, like pretty much all of it. It was only until later that you actually get it written down in the text. Um, and then later on, you know, in church history, they put it all together, but, but that's kind of my view where the oral traditions always existed in that in sort of a linear fashion. And then you have Mark that was written first, and then you have the other gospels, the, the other synoptic gospels that I've written later. Um, because I don't I don't like to view it in terms of how like how we would view, you know, documents where because I mean in, in our culture we live in a what's called a text oriented culture, right? So what we do, we we can, you know, we can copy from you know, one book and they write in the other book. I don't think that's what really was going on at the time. I think that each gospel writer had sort of their own perspective and then they wrote their own, you know, oral tradition, so to speak. And then sometimes it overlapped. And sometimes like there could even be, you know, legit contradictions, right? So that could also occur where there are legit actual contradictions that can't be resolved, but that doesn't really affect the reliability because well, if there's contradictions, well, that just shows, that just shows me at least that there seems to be, you know, oral traditions that were consistent and that each one was kind of independently confirmed. That's kind of my view, but, uh, but yeah, I, but yeah, I mean, if you, if you don't necessarily agree with that, I mean, you can let me know what your thoughts are on that. Um, so I don't have 
a a lot of oral tradition playing a part in my modeling of how the gospel literature was produced um i think that uh the arguments of thomas brody for example and um and dykstra um are fairly convincing of the less need for oral tradition but but that's like a that's a very broad thing i'd rather get specific and talk about the way in which oral tradition is acting as an explanatory hypothesis for specific data we find within the gospels so let's take an example um when we observe uh verbatim uh agreements between uh matthew and mark or luke and mark what how is the oral tradition hypothesis expecting that data versus how is a literary hypothesis including the use of an underlying source uh explaining it and my conjecture to you is that um in that question that is uh, verbatim agreements and redactional uh, verbatim plus redactional agreements i think that the literary hypothesis where one author has access to and is using um, another source is a better explanation of the data that we find um, whereas an oral hypothesis requires us to assume a um an, an unmotivated uh, ad hoc uh, hypothesis involving uh, a controlled process of transmission utilizing uh, oral transmission practices we don't have an evidence for any of the um, new testament authors and what I mean here is that there is no independent information that gives us um, uh, evidence that the sources that the gospel authors used were following these highly precise, highly um, uh, controlled oral practices. And if you want to see an analysis of that, I would suggest reading uh, Bart Ehrman's, or at least a partial analysis of that. I, I would suggest reading Bart Ehrman's um, Jesus Before the Gospels, because um, I, I think that gets into uh, a, a really good discussion about what oral hypotheses can explain, what type of expectations we can draw from them, and therefore the way in which uh, the relationships between the synoptics are not adequately explained. Okay, so would your would your alternative hypothesis be that it was redacted? It was basically redacted criticism. Is that what you said, or was it something similar? Yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, the authors of the Gospel, Matthew and Luke, had access to uh, and were utilizing um, either by memory or direct access during the process of composition, uh, a version of the Gospel of Mark. It might not be precisely what our version is because, you know, there is quite a lot of possibility for interpolation and changes, but it's definitely, um, it's definitely something that allows for the verbatim, verbatim agreements as well as uh, deliberate redactional differences that when taken as a whole and considered in conjunction uh, allow us to formulate uh, redactional profile hypotheses um, if another piece of uh, another book worth reading if you're into this stuff is um, Mark Goodacre's The Case Against Q and regardless about whether or not yeah, yeah. Q, Q existed um, his chapter two I think it is where he gives a an argument for the um, uh, the priority of Mark he, he does this by use of a concept called redactional or editorial fatigue where um, it's a known phenomena in our background knowledge that when 
utilizing underlying sources, an author will make an effort to make changes to that source that over time during the process of compositional redaction or uh, copying uh, will uh, carry lowered uh, fidelity to uh, changes. So the idea here is that like, I, I take a story and what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy that story, but I'm going to make my own uh, changes to it. And what we observe, at least with the Gospel of Matthew and, and Luke, is that there are, uh, are occasions where data we have is best explained by the hypothesis that the redactor, Matthew or Luke, is taking Mark as an underlying source and is trying to make changes to it and then failing to keep consistent with those changes as the story goes on in a fashion that resembles like fatigue. And uh, when I say fatigue, I mean like that in the process of copying, you get effectively uh, cognitively tired or you, you sort of lose a thread of emendation you were trying to carry out. Um, there's a couple of examples of this. One of them uh, that Goodacre describes in chapter two is uh, during the redaction of uh, uh, the account of Herod uh, the Great, oh, sorry, Herod and John the Baptist. Um, he, the author, uh, makes changes about the disposition that Herod had towards John that he fails to carry out in the course of his redaction. Um, another example is in uh, Luke's, um, uh, uh, well, I mean, this is a slightly different example, but in Luke's uh, rewriting of the parable of the talents um he fails to carry out some of the redactional uh changes he wants to make through to the end of the story and ends up having Mithian content bleed into his story toward the end um but i mean this is really just me merely to say that i think that there's a variety of data that um is is less um, adequately explained by oral hypotheses and better explained by literary hypotheses. So um, literary, and, again, you talk about redaction, right? Because I just want to... Yeah, redaction. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, there are also, I think that there's also a lot of content in the Gospel of Mark that's best explained no, by yeah, li um, literary hypotheses purely as well. But Yeah, because like I said in the beginning, I'm not as well read on... New Testament reliability is my other other stuff I study. So, because um, the stuff I study is all philo philosophy of mind, at least most of it. So, um, you can send me the link to. I'll read it and I'll check out those books. Um, though, we'll see. Because this pandemic, I'm gonna, you know, hopefully my job will um, give me enough money so I can get those that material. But, um, but yeah, I'll check it out. I mean, for redaction criticism. Um, again, I would go back to the book I recommended earlier, which is the Jesus legend. And in, I think it's, it's around page 400 that they talk briefly talk about redaction criticism and, um, all that stuff. So, and again, they're, they're arguing for, you know, the oral hypotheses, um, cause they're mostly arguing against redaction criticism in the book. So you can check that out if you want, but, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I'll definitely and, and check out. I'll I'll Don't get me wrong. I do think that there are oral um, sources underlying parts of the Gospels. Um, it's just more this idea that um, the literary relationships between the Gospels can be explained by oral hypotheses. That's the part that I would reject. Um, okay. But it's not that there are no oral processes involved. It's just that... Um, to me, the evidence is clear and unambiguous that the authors, regardless of what type of oral sources they had available to them, were using uh, the Gospels as like actual literary works. Um, and yeah, and but yeah, we can get into okay. that perhaps in another discussion. Yeah, yeah. And I also, I don't know if you got this book. Um, and again, it's not its not even biased toward any of you particularly. 
It's called Jesus, Skepticism, and the Problem of History. Have you gotten that book? or Because this is pretty new. No, I don't, okay. I don't even know who that's by. It's, it's, it's actually written by a lot of authors, and there's like a multiple essays from multiple different people that talk about like the new updated stuff. Um, I have to reread it because it's been like a year since I've read it. But uh, any mm-hmm. any like articles in there that you would recommend in particular? Um, no, probably the one we were just talking about. Um, hold on, let me try to find it. I know Boyd. He wrote a chapter on oral New Testament reliability, or at least oral traditions, like we were discussing. Hold on, let me see which chapter it was. Um, you know, it's somewhere in here. Oh, wait, here's, a, here's a question for you. Do you think that there are oral traditions underlying the um, uh, infancy narratives in the Gospel of Matthew? Infancy, like, oh, you mean the... Or the birth narratives. I don't know. Um, I'll have to look into that. Not that, I don't, that specifically, I don't know. Um, I think it's more likely, yes, but I could be wrong. So, so that's what I think. But, uh, but yeah, I'll have to, cause I'm planning, you know, if I could de- if, as long as I don't deconvert, I might do a video series on that on new Testament reliability, but we'll see. It's going to take a while, a lot of research. So, you know, if I turn out to be wrong, then got to be wrong, but, but yeah, that specifically, I don't really know for sure. Yeah, I'm um, maybe uh, h- how much longer do you want to go for? I'm probably available for another 15 minutes or 20 minutes. Okay. But... Yeah, let's just briefly talk about quantum mechanics, because um, I know that's what you kind of wanted to discuss with me a few about a week ago. Um, so what what is your I guess we can discuss interpretations because I have my view on it is I don't necessarily see all interpretations as competing against each other. I think there are certain aspects of interpretations that kind of overlap with each other. Um, so what what's your position on interpretations? Do you think that they're all completely competitive against each other? Or do you think that some of them can, can kind of overlap and one explains the other or whatever? What do you think? Um, there are quite a lot of interpretations. Um, so, uh, yeah, I do think that most of the ones that are worth considering are competitive with each other. So as an example, like, um, the, uh, Giraldi River, uh, Weber, Romini, uh, the GRW hypothesis actually, uh, puts forward a, an altered um, uh, mathematical model for reality that involves uh, spontaneous collapse. Um, the Bohmian mechanics or De Broglie-Bohm theory involves um, uh, an additional uh, piece of mathematical machinery to pick out uh, the real trajectories. Um, right the um the objective collapse or like the measurement postulate style copenhagen yeah. um involves what i see as some like non-unitary um postulate yeah which where, i don't um, yeah so i do think that they are competing maybe not all of them are competing with one another but um to, to some degree or another, um, they take different positions uh, ontologically with respect to the wave function. Um, and they take, uh, they either add in or don't add in additional laws um, in combination with um, our sort of usual Schrodinger or Dirac picture. Right. Yeah, I, I've kind of viewed, um, so I basically, I break it up into like, I think three or four classes. So you have hidden variable theories, which is Bohem mechanics. I wouldn't say that GRW is considered a hidden variable, though it still postulates something that isn't directly found within, you know, the Schrodinger equation. It's kind of like this extra force of nature, so to speak. So 
you know, you have the extra forces of nature, hidden variables, GRW, it's one class. And then you have um, operational in interpretations, which is Copenhagen, um, the, what's the other one? Um, the ensemble interpretation, though, I don't know any physicist that actually holds the ensemble. I think that's just an older version of Copenhagen. So you got that, which basically treats quantum mechanics, you know, just pure pragmatically. And then you have um, what's called the relational interpretations, which can include, you know, just the standard relational interpretation of Ravli. I can't pronounce his name. And then you also have, um, yeah, yeah. And then you also have um, the consciousness causes collapse view, which that could, that could, that doesn't have to be relativistic though. To me, I think it does have to be relativistic. So you got that. And then you also have another class of interpretations, which is the many worlds, which I kind of place that under its own camp because it's it doesn't really um, it's it's unitary as well. So you you know you got to take that into account as well. Um, so my my stance is basically that any interpretation that is not unitary, I think, has its has a lot of problems because it it violates what's called um, the conservation of energy but not just classical information but also quantum information so the collapse of the wave function under non-relativistic quantum mechanics would basically destroy quantum information which i think it's non-unitary so you that would include you know copenhagen um the the interpretation that inspiring philosophy proposes that would also be non-unitary so i don't accept his view i kind of modify it a little bit and then, obviously, um, I don't know any others that would violate it because the ones that, but I think that's pretty much it as far as non-unitary ones. And then unitary would be, you know, many worlds is unitary, relativistic is unitary, um, and Bohemian mechanics is also unitary. So I would ex I would be more friendly, or I would I accept the unitary interpretations over and against the non-unitary interpretations. I mean, what do you think? Do you think that in order for an interpretation to be more probable, it has to have unitary in it, or do you think it doesn't really matter? Um, it's not really how I cash out the evaluation of it. Um, I think, well, the, the Schrodinger picture um, or the direct picture, it, it's, the formalism is a unitary theory. It it has this property where, um, like, you can go from uh, one state uh, in the present or the past or whatever, like one indexical state to a future ind indexical state, and you can go backwards. And um, it's in that sense, like there isn't like a loss of information. Um, you can, uh, but the difficulty is that that's like manifestly not what we observe um, in our everyday experience. Like the Schrodinger picture describes these uh, evolving macroscopic superpositions that include measurement devices and humans and cats and all sorts of different things um, right. in macroscopic and macroscopic distinct superpositions with one another and it's quite clear that like uh if we are to like imagine that that's what we experience that that doesn't that's not correct like right. we don't see the we don't see the um Geiger counter both clicking or hear the Geiger counter both clicking and not clicking at the same time or we don't see um, when we observe like some kind of radioactive piece of material in a cloud chamber we don't see like a spherical wave um, coming out of it or like another example was uh, the Schrodinger's cat we don't see it being alive and dead at the same time so there's like definitely something about that picture that we need to understand further about like how it is it's meant to explain um, our everyday experience, our observations. Now, right. I think that there has been good progress starting with Everett. Um, oh yeah, I agree with you. Heading on to into modern 
uh, foundations of quantum mechanics with people like David Deutsch and David Wallace and um, Sean Carroll and Max Tegmark and folks like that. I do think that there has been some progress in combination with decoherence theory to explain why it is that we wouldn't expect if it were the case that the Schrodinger picture was right, um, that uh, we would observe the cat being alive and dead at the same time, like some kind of blurry <laughs> phenomenon, right. you know, or, like, mm -hmm. so I think that like, we've got, we've got, we've made some really good uh, ground phenomenologically within the theory to uh, within that is the unitary formula formalism of explaining like how despite there being described these macroscopic superpositions this can be mapped on and accounted for in our experience um and so as like a conservative kind of person who doesn't really want to go too far beyond the physics i think that like our best strategy at the moment is to continue on within the the version of quantum mechanics that has been confirmed by um you know repeated experiment and observation we should continue attempting to understand how this maps on to the manifest image or like the world of everyday experiences and i think that progress is good but there's still a lot of like open problems so for example um david deutsch made some pretty good strides um toward recovering the born rule from within a form of deci decision theory uh theoretic approaches uh max tegmark has made some good progress towards recovering the born rule uh sorry the idea for people um not following is that uh max born um noticed that like the observational outcomes conform to um the mod squared amplitude uh, of the amplitude so in the schrodinger equation or like so if we take like a direct picture and we talk about um the there are these things uh, trying to describe yeah yeah so there's a concept of an an amplitude and it's this number it's a complex number that's associated with particular um uh uh eigenvectors of an operator and you in order to get like statistics about what you're going to observe in a particular measurement you take like the inner product of that or you take like the mod squared amplitude of the amplitude and from that you can get a probability that you'll observe that outcome and that born rule which has been the heart and soul of making predictions from quantum mechanics is something that's in addition to the you know underlying wave function picture so it's like this additional uh measurement postulate or it's it's this uh this thing that you add on to the theory right. to make it make predictions about what you'll observe in exper in experiments and it's very tightly connected with this idea that like the types of operators that represent observables are these things called hermitian operators and um the property of them is that like they have all of the eigenvectors of anyway let's not get into that but no yeah um, yeah <laughs> the, the but the the key takeaway is that with people who have been continuing on with the everedian paradigm they have made progress towards recovering uh how probabilities manifest within quantum mechanics from a um a principled approach so without trying to add anything additional to the ontology of the theory um and then there's right. also been progress made on what um people call the preferred basis problem or the ontology problem too and you can read about that and david wallace well yeah because no, because typically the two biggest objections to many worlds is the many world, or not many, well, yeah, the biggest objections is the born rule problem and then the preferred basis problem. And typically, I think the best way to solve those two problems is to, for me, I don't, I don't treat many worlds like 
as like these parallel universes that all exist, you know, like 100% certainty it exists somewhere out there, right? Because that's typically the science fiction-y way of thinking about winning worlds. For me, I think of it in terms of, you know, just quantum information existing in reality. So the Born rule is basically, you know, just a certain like representation of, you know, a certain like branches going off in the wave function. But again, those branches are not other worlds, so to speak. They all exist in the same world. It's just the quantum information that we're using to describe the many worlds is still the same, even though technically speaking, they're not, you know, they don't exist as parallel universes. So, I mean, what do you think about that? Do you think that we should think of many worlds not as, you know, parallel universes, but rather just this quantum information that kind of evolves in their own branches, so to speak? Um, I take Wallace's approach. So I think that... Um, there's a good case to be made that if you um, allow for um, the same kind of uh, observation that tigers don't appear in the fundamental description of particle physics, um, but yet they are an emergent phenomena of um, the goings-on and the structural relationships within particle physics, then equally um, you don't need the branches and the sort of isolated or orthogonal worlds that come out of um, the Schrodinger dynamics. You don't need to see those as being um put into the theory from the beginning or appearing as terms in the theory. Instead, like you see them as uh, structural consequences that come out of the underlying dynamics in the same way that tigers do. Um, so I don't know if I've made that really clear, but the idea is that like tables and chairs, they don't uh, come into our underlying physical theory about the world. They are some type of uh, structural emergent byproduct of the operating of the laws of physics that involve like you know um you know wave functions being in certain states and having particular relationships um right and so i don't see us needing to have um worlds put into the theory from the beginning i think it's okay to like recognize that if this state were to undergo Schrodinger dynamics and it was to you know continue to evolve and interact with other things such that it undergoes like this decoherence process where we end up having two uh, branches that are non-interacting um, I think that because of the fact that this underlying quantum information that's the way that you put it yeah. because of the fact that it has these structural relationships that resemble tigers and those structural relationships exist and resemble tigers in both of these orthogonal branches that have developed. I think that like we are really forced to say that, okay, well, there's there's a tiger in that part and a tiger in that part too. Um, so my, well, and I mean, if you want to scale it down, there's a um, particular Geiger counter in that part of the wave, wave function and a Geiger counter in that part of the wave function, one of which is clipped and the other which is not clipped um, in the case of, you know, some radioactive material. Right. So my position is that, like, if within this, you know, quantum information that you talk about, you can find the um, the structural relationships that uh, we think it's valid to call a tiger or a geiger counter <laughs> then um then it's not um it, it just follows by implication that those things would be tigers and geiger counters um and there's nothing that like picks out uh any one as being more real than the other um except for the fact that we, we find ourselves having the observation of one versus the other Right. That that sounds very similar to my kind of position where 
it's only the perception where it's only it's only in our perceptions where we get a sense of a defined physical state but then outside that perception you know it doesn't really it's kind of like in a superposition of possible states or you know it could be in these you know branches so to speak so you know i i kind of com- i kind of what i do is i combine relativistic quantum mechanics with many worlds and i basically say that it's only in our perceptions from our reference frame that we experience a well-defined world but then once it's outside our perceptions um it's kind of like it exists as not as defined states but rather this quantum probability quantum information that exists kind of out there so to speak yeah see i i, I don't take that position but like uh, i mean yeah. you know, this is all speculative anyway but right i don't take that position because the problem with it in my view at least is that there is in that other part of the wave function also a you know uh uh kyle that ex- has the distinct experience of the other observation so for example if you have a geiger counter and we're talking about whether or not it clicks or does not click like within the um description of the world if you accept it as um if you accept accept something like uh you know wave function realism or you think that like what we're describing is something real um then it follows by implication of the theory that there is a version of kyle that sees discrete like distinctly the other experience <laughs> like it, oh, and that's right. part of the problem well, it's all like, relativistic the, right so that's kind of how i think i mean it doesn't the theory. relativity part doesn't add anything or take away anything like it doesn't that it doesn't have really any relevance there in my in my view um like it's not changing any th- any of the underlying observations um it's still the case within relativistic quantum mechanics that there is described within the branches of the wave function a kyle that observes one outcome and a kyle that observes the other outcome now you like when you go and look at the geiger counter um you obviously only have a distinct experience of one of those outcomes. Um, but still, within the formalism, there is a version of Kyle that sees the distinct version of the other outcome. So I don't really see, like, why, except on pain of ad hocness or um, on pain of, uh, like, sort of, like, special pleading, that we would see one as being real than more than the other one. Um, but... But I also completely admit that all this stuff is kind of crazy. Like the the difficulty is that, and here's something that I would really discourage you in. I don't use quantum mechanics as a means to formulate grand metaphysical ideas. I don't use it as a means to support uh, atheism or um, you know naturalism or something like this. Um, I don't use it as a premise in an argument against other people's positions um unless like it's some discussion about quantum mechanics itself um and because i recognize unlike maybe michael jones i I, i'm i don't want to speak for him but i recognize that this is quite clearly an area where the best the people who are best placed to evaluate these positions that is both the philosophers of physics and those who are in physics working in foundations of quantum mechanics these people really disagree with one another there is a lot of disagreement in the field there are people who um, take many different positions and see it different ways by their lights. And they are having an ongoing discussion at the moment about what are the implications of quantum mechanics. And um, given that I'm a layman, that yes, I know some quantum mechanics. Yes, I took some quantum mechanics at university and I have a better grasp than most laymen. I'm not an expert and um neither are you or and i know that you don't claim to be um, no, no. and neither is michael and um so i really think that we need to be humble about this field and my worry and i think it, this is a worry that i share with people like uh alan aldridge is that when you make your theism 
dependent on a particular but highly controversial version or you know interpretation of quantum mechanics you're putting your theism in a pretty difficult position <laughs> um like because the um well to begin with like you're i mean it's all really what i just described um you're not an expert on the subject and you're uh, evaluating it as a non-expert at best your position could be described and when i say yours i guess i probably have michael in mind more than anybody yeah. described as taking some particular um uh views that are not consensus or not shared even by a majority of experts and making that um the you know a central premise in an argument for a well, god i mean well right i mean we don't use theists don't typically use um their arguments based on one area of research so you know we don't we don't make it dependent on just one interpretation of quantum mechanics i just want to make that point clear um like we don't have to do that like there's other views well, we can I definitely take. don't think you do right yeah, I definitely don't think you have to. And in fact, I would discourage it because I think that it's like, um, I kind of think it's an abuse of physics, really. I mean, maybe that's uncharitable. Well, yeah, I mean, I, there I, are I, there are a lot of abuses of physics. Like, I think I, I private messaged you about this, how um, just because consciousness causes collapse or just because we think it does, that doesn't mean that therefore we can control reality or do magic, right? So there needs well, to be. That's the other thing is that right. consciousness doesn't cause collapse. Like that's just oh. like almost. Uh, there are very very few people working in foundations of physics who think that consciousness causes collapse. Consciousness is. Um, uh, it's definitely the case that like human brains are large macroscopic objects with large numbers of. Uh, uh, microscopic degrees of freedom and so they are the exact type of thermal objects that um you uh, expect decoherence to occur with like you can't co you can't keep the coherence of quantum superpositions with a large when interacting with a large macroscopic object i mean there's been calculations done that like the human eye as an example um within an incredibly short amount of time uh decoherence will occur upon uh interaction with the human eye so it's like yeah that's clear everybody agrees with that but the same is also true with like geiger counters and other big large thermal objects well, that's, <laughs> like, that's why it's sort of, well that's exactly why i take a more relativistic approach to the whole thing where yes consciousness does collapse away function but only from your reference frame so you know obviously something that's non-conscious can also cause collapse but when i say that consciousness right, causes then, collapse then, well, right but then what's the point in saying consciousness causes collapse because in that case there are reference you know in general relativity like there's a reference frame for everything like so it, well, it's i not, know right like, that's different frames so it, it sort of doesn't really add anything and to me it just sort of leads people into this like old idea of like these presentations of um double slit experiments where one says that it's only if a conscious observer <laughs> looks at the 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 electron going through one slit over the other that collapse well, occurs what do you <laughs> what do you <laughs> think about thing. well what about i'm sure you're aware of this called von neumann change so that's typically the argument that ip makes which is that the reason why decoherence does not fully explain um, wave function collapses because it still needs like if one particle collapses another then you need something to cause that particle to collapse and so on and so on so what would be kind of your response to the von neumann chain type of argument well so i may um like if i'm to take what i see to be the most plausible um version of quantum mechanics which you know as i've obviously described right, many I, worlds I right it's pretty controversial um within philosophy of physics uh, i think that the there's a universal wave function so there is um really just like a, a unified uh uh wave function in hilbert space that's undergoing schrodinger dynamics so this problem is like there's 
it's effectively like a non-problem. Like all the um, all of these branches that are going on within the wave function are all occurring within a global wave function. So it's really just like a misunderstanding of the view to think that there's an issue here. Um, but I think that things like Wigner's friend thought experiments like that and efforts that have been uh, done to perform an analogies of this, I think show that um, there are inconsistencies in viewing there being objective conscious experiencing of um, individuals uh, and maintaining that like reality is a unity effectively like that there's um, a single description of what is going on that's valid. I think it's the case that um, uh, from, you know, one perspective, uh, the well, it, it, in other words, what I'm trying to say here is that in the consciousness causes collapse view, I think that it leads to a form of um, like inconsistency where you are forced to maintain that um, well, you, you're forced to give an explanation about which con which consciousness is uh, is collapsing effectively. Well, right. Um, no, yeah, that's why I take a relativistic approach, which is where one conscious agent will collapse the reference frame. What, and then, of course, there could be hierarchies of conscious agents, right? So that's kind of what Donald Hoffman gets into, where you basically have these conscious agents on top of each other, where I guess he, he describes it where... Two conscious, the, a system of two conscious agents can constitute one single conscious agent, but then that single conscious agent is still distinct, right? So you have these different conscious agents that will collapse wave functions from their reference frames until you eventually, he's not a theist, by the way, but you kind of get the point where you have this system of interacting conscious agents that will kind of um, explain quantum mechanics in that sort of way. So that's kind of the view that he kind of proposes, but but yeah. I mean, I think that all of these problems manifest uh, without talking about consciousness at all, but just talking about thermal sort of macroscopic uh, states. I think that um, all of these underlying problems discussing quantum, uh, sorry, discussing quantum, uh, sorry, uh, consciousness can be just redescribed using thermal macroscopic states, and it's all the same evaluation that comes out. I mean, ultimately, I think that what occurs is that there there isn't a collapsing of the wave function, other than it just being some kind of um, subjective phenomena that when we interact with things, we can only observe, you know, eigenvalues of these eigenfunctions Ooh. or eigenvalues. Right. So I, I think that like it, it's the case that if you take the Schrodinger picture seriously and you take a conservative model towards it, um, it isn't the case that there is some particular thing that picks out um, which one you observe or, over another. Like it's just merely the case that there is this uh, evolving branching structure of the wave function. And so there, there's not really any problem to be had here it's like i think that the problems to be had are for um maybe like hidden variables folks actually this this is sort of a digression but this goes back to like another like issue that i have with uh ip in particular is that i don't actually think he understands um the like bell's theorem i don't think he understands uh, the coach inspector theorem um, sorry, coach and speaker, um, because he seems to think that these are uh, like, it, well, let's frame it a different way. He doesn't appear to be aware of the premises that go into the de derivation of the theorems um, that mean that they don't really have a relevance in a discussion of many worlds. Um, so, for example, when you when you watch uh, IP's um, uh, video on uh, the many worlds interpretation, it's almost like he's kind of arguing against hidden variable theories because he's using um, like the KS theorem and, and Bell's theorem, um, but without realizing that they contain underlying assumptions that in particular about the uh, distinct 
uh, outcomes, singular outcomes of experiments that are in contradiction with Everettian quantum mechanics. So, yeah. Well, I mean, here's the, I mean, I, I don't, I guess you could, because here's the thing, I don't really have necessarily a problem with many worlds. I only apply it to quantum information, right? That's kind of what I said earlier. But when it comes to like macroscopic states, like you said earlier, then why is there no equation for collapse if that can fully explain collapse? Like there isn't, like we kind of, you know. Makes sense. Okay. No, like if there, what I'm saying is if the environment can fully explain collapse, like you state, then why is there no collapse equation? Like, why is there not an equation we can use to say, okay, this is the defined state and this is what explains collapse. We don't need consciousness because we have this equation that can describe it. And we don't, you know, we don't need consciousness because the full system is collapsed, so to speak. Um, so perhaps like maybe we could talk a little bit more about decoherence because in um in the schrodinger picture with like unitary dynamics what you find is like say if you have like a superposition right you have a, an electron that spin up and an electron it, that's right that's in a sp superposition of spin up and spin down right and then you put it through like a you know like a stern girl like experiment or like something that allows you to get uh macroscopic or sorry like measurable uh uh information about um like or distinct experimental outcomes depending or sensitive toward which uh superposition direction it's in sorry spin direction yeah, it's spin, yeah yeah so in this scenario the Schrodinger picture describes this, like these two sort of like uh, parallel streams of goings on that evolve, one in which, and they become orthogonal with one another, one in which uh, the measurement device sees spin up and one in which the measurement device sees spin down. So like when you're asking the question about like, well, why isn't there like an equation that uh, that like explains the collapse or something like that. My, my answer is merely to say, well, there is like, it's just that you're like, one is imagining that by collapse, what you're thinking about is one of those outcomes being the real one or the distinctly real one or right. something like that. But that that's the part that I just don't really think is so. Um, okay, follows so from basically, so I don't think that there is an equation that distinguishes which one is real or which one you will subjectively experience. I think that the Schrodinger picture or like the Everett picture or whatever you want to call it, like it, it literally tells you that there will be a version of you that sees it this way, and there will be a version of you that sees it this way. Okay. So when you're trying to like ask a question about like like why collapse or something like that well i mean the solution is just staring you at you in the face well um, i mean it's not really well yeah because i mean obviously if you take the many worlds approach then that would kind of be your answer well there is no collapse well technically there is no collapse right because it all branches into you know multiple worlds well, there is, and there is collapse it's just that it's a different thing than what people thought it was i mean decoherence theory effectively explains what collapses it's like these macroscopic de degrees of free freedom becoming entangled with the superposition right and yeah. then it just sort of it causes um their the so, unitary evolution of the schrodinger equation okay. just causes there to be these distinct macroscopic goings on so let me try to rephrase it. So let's assume that many worlds is not true. How do you explain collapse? How do you explain how microscopic things, assume, assuming that many worlds is not true, can fully explain collapse without some sort of like, you know, defined state like consciousness, for example? Like, how do you do that? I mean, yeah, that's that's a measurement problem. I, I honestly don't know. Like, I, I don't see... I mean, I think that, like, GRW is, like, interesting. Um, like, the this idea that there is some objective um, collapse process. Uh, but, you know, obviously it's a distinct physical theory from quantum mechanics, and it's yet to have experimental... Uh, uh, evidence for it. Um, Bohmian mechanics, I find it to have uh, really like uh, 
pleasing sort of intuitive aspect to it but the difficulty comes when you it doesn't match with it doesn't really scale fit well right like, it doesn't fit with special relativity calculate. so so i think yeah, yeah. and I mean, it's sort of like ontological primitives in some sense are different from what contemporary physics is positing so contemporary physics is talking about field theories and it's not clear how uh, bohmian mechanics can be formulated in that fashion uh, i haven't seen the successful uh, formulation of uh, something so that you would actually right so you would project. actually agree that bohemian mechanics doesn't work like for the most part it seems to be like very ad hoc right uh I think it works for giving it an intuitive picture of what might be underlying things like the double slit experiment, um, but I don't think it's right. I think it's going to turn out to not work. Um, well, I mean, I think that in some respects it's already having difficulties with contemporary physics. I mean, one of the virtues of many worlds is that like within cosmology, most people in cosmology take this approach to quantum mechanics because um, it's very difficult when you're talking about like the global uh, ontology of the world to, um, you know, right. take some, uh, well, anyway, to do the calculations and get um, models, you kind of like can't arbitrarily pick out particular states of the wave function as being real. Um, they, anyway, uh, that's a digression. Um, so my difficulty with like models that involve consciousness is that they there are precise questions that can be formulated uh targeted towards them that these models can't answer and ultimately that's because they're not precise models so they don't have any uh precise model about what constitutes consciousness in the sense that what has the f sufficient properties um to cause collapse um the they so they don't make um any and when I'm talking about this, I'm not talking about it from a hand wavy um, sort of ph philosophy perspective. <laughs> I mean, it, that's actually a pejorative. Well, I should. I mean, but I'm talking about it from I'm talking about it from the perspective of like an actual physical model. Um, well, there is a physical model that explains why uh, one state over another is picked out as being real and. There isn't a physical model that explains uh, what type of physical system constitutes consciousness, a conscious system sufficient to cause collapse. Um, well, I think it's because, you know, you would say that consciousness is not physical, so it can't be described in equations, right? I mean, that's kind of like what I don't people know. like it's, me would that... propose. I mean, that's the point. Yeah. I mean, so it seems like you're... My, my difficulty with that is that I don't think that that constitutes an explanation. So you don't think it's I don't think okay. Could, so, so basically, like when, I think when people make that move, I think that they've chosen not to engage in what I think. I mean, this well, is just my judgment, right? Right. My but well, that's uh, why. Yeah, hold on, just let okay, me no, get no, this off. I, um. I don't think that that um, form of explanation constrains uh, anticipations of experience. So I think that um, it's it's merely like a curiosity stopper in my mind. Like it hasn't gone to, it's effectively just given a label to something that, that isn't understood and then said, we're not going to explain it further using like actual concrete models. And maybe that's okay. I mean, I personally, I don't really buy into that sort of thing. I think it's, um, uh, it, yeah, I mean, it goes back to what I was saying before. It fails to constrain experience. There's no prediction from it you can make. Um, because it's not an actual model. Um, it doesn't predict the phenomena. It just sort of gives a label to it. All right. Well, I mean, I think people like me would just say that it's, you know, it's non-physical. It's fundamental to reality. We're not, you know, we're not saying that it's a physical system, right? Because consciousness is not a physical thing. It's, it's the foundation of reality itself. So it doesn't need 
the sort of equations that other things like physical things would actually need. So, I mean, that's kind of right. my but in a, point. But of then if I ask you a question, so say, for example, if we take, um, if we take the, the model that I was presenting before about an electron, that it's in, in a superposition of be, being up and down, and we talk about our experience of that and observing one outcome over another, for you, what about your model explains why position or spin up versus spin down or spin down versus spin up is observed over the other one? Well, for that, um, I would recommend there's a, there's a paper by um, Henry Stapp. It's called Attention, Intention, and Will. I think, I don't know the exact, in quantum physics, I don't know the exact the title because I haven't read it. For, it's been a while since I've read it. But he gives sort of an explanation of how, you know, the brain and the mind will kind of interact and cause, you know, conscious you know, quantum collapse and stuff like that. I'll send you the link in Facebook. So, because I haven't okay, read but, but it, so why? I can't. What's your explanation. <laughs> well, basically, my explanation, I mean, if I'm going to put it in simple terms, um, the consciousness causes collapse. Because I have an explanation. Okay. So basically but what happens is our non-physical mind will interact with the non-physical world or quantum information, and then that'll create what's called the physical world, which is our perceptions. That's basically it. So okay. it's, it's an interaction so, yeah. with our non-mental mind. No, no sorry, non, I, that was a, I said that wrong. Non-physical mind, and then the non-physical reality of quantum information will interact to create our perceptions of the physical world. So that would be okay. kind of so. Um, maybe the best thing to do is to ask questions about it. So, how does that explain it? No, because it's just in our perceptions, right? So we don't we don't perceive um, a super. You know, we don't perceive you know quantum information in terms of things being in superposition, precisely because um, it's the interaction between our conscious minds. And the conscious minds. And again, you can go back to um, who is what is oh yeah, Henry Stapp's paper. So basically, nature gives back a direct choice that we don't choose. It's just you know because again, it's it's objective to us, right? So nature will give us a direct choice. I think this is how he says it, and then we respond yeah, with a a, a, a a what choice? A direct choice, and then we respond with the Heisenberg choice, essentially. So that's kind of again. That's what's that's direct, that's what's a direct choice. Again, you you have to read. That's kind of the language that Henry Stapp uses, and then Inspiring Philosophy also uses it in his video called "The Measurement Problem." So he kind of explains it a little more there. But um, I'll send you the paper by Henry Stapp, and he kind of gets into how all that works. Um, I don't like to, for me personally, since I'm more of the philosophy guy, I don't really get into the, the physics aspects of it, but. Um, if you want to read the physics aspect of it, I I'll guess send you what that I'm paper. Concerned about, what, what I'm concerned about for you is when you think that it's that it's explained. Like if you think that this is doing some explanation, and I inquire as to how. Like so, like how does a well, there direct or is what is a direct choice and how does a direct choice explain why we observe one component of the superposition over another well it's because it's um it's basically what nature gives us essentially so it's it's just what nature gives us because it's objective and then we respond with the heisenberg choice um and again but i'm, I'm gonna I have to if I said that, if I said that, like, so for example, if we just like remove all of those words and then we talk about like the spin and then like you ask me, oh, well, what, Cam, what explains why we observe spin up versus spin down? And if I just said to you, oh, it's just what nature gives us, like, would you think that that was an explanation? Well, no, because I, I can't tell you directly right now because I don't have, I haven't read the paper in a while, so... Okay. Well, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. fair enough. I, I understand no, yeah, because I, I wasn't expecting you to ask me specifically how exactly it works because there's other physicists like Henry Stapp that I mentioned that kind of explain how that works. And again, I'll have to read his paper. And so I'll, I'll send you the paper. He kind of explains it. But basically, he makes a distinction between 
the Heisenberg choice and the Dirac choice, and the Heisenberg choice is what nature gives us, and then we respond with a Dirac choice. And again, you can read his paper; he kind of gets into the details of all the, how all that works. But, but yeah, that's right. kind of the explanation this, he gives. I think that this is really similar to like a question following David Chalmers that I had about your version of cosmic idealism. I'm, how do you solve the subject constitution problem? That is, how do you, um, when faced with the metaphysical possibility that there would be no uh, uh, subjects distinct from God uh, constituted within the cosmic mind, how, um, like, how are subjects uh, constituted um, within the cosmic mind? Like, what's oh. the? Are they like? Um, are they emergent? Um, oh, you're asking me? Like oh, a, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, for me, I would say that um, smaller minds like us were disassociated alters of um, universal consciousness. So we would still be supervenient in the sense that we would depend on the cosmic mind. But we would right. not. So what I'm asking is like, how does that, um, how does that work? It's like the same when you say that we are disassociated alters. Um, so you're giving there, I think, some uh, some informal description of how subjects are constituted in the cosmic mind. What I'm curious about is is how. It's um it's the same way that people with disassociative identity disorder would um like basically cut off it would take the larger consciousness and then cut off um within that system essentially. So it's basically like disassociations will localize themselves um into the universe essentially. So again, disassociation entails that it's localized in some sense and that it appeared later in the timeline. Um, but, but yeah, that's basically how it works. Again, to the details, um, you would have do to look at, the feel like that's an, sorry, I'm not, I am sorry if this is getting rude, but do you feel like that's an explanation of how? Well, yeah, because I don't have to explain how physics can produce consciousness. I just say that consciousness is fundamental. And then, um, we're kind of disassociated alters from that universal mind, so to speak. In the same way of how you know yeah. our dream characters at night would be disassociated alters from ourselves how that exactly works i don't really know again there's a lot of neuroscience that goes into that but but yeah so i think that my difficulty in following these perspectives is that like i'm i'm seeking an explanation and um i'm getting a description um, but I don't think I'm getting an explanation. And one of the worries that I have is that one of the appeals of idealism is that it's meant to um, be an ontologically simpler model because it has consciousness as something that's a primitive and it's fundamental in the ontology. And when we take a cosmic mind perspective, um, I think that we have some explanatory work to do for um, that accounts for how it is that uh, subjects such as humans or subjects such as um, frogs are disassociated alters from the conscious mind um, and how uh, they are dis associated in such a way that they have conscious experience and how the, the varieties of their conscious experience arise from um, or like what distinguishes their varieties of, of conscious experience. And I don't think that there's really an explanation there from what I've read of, um, of Kat, 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 Kat um, And I think like Chalmers, for example, raises, I think he points out that there's a good research program here um, in metaphysics, but I think that there are still significant open problems. And I think that the open problems that remain 
bear on um, this claim that ontologically there is something superior about putting consciousness as a fundamental to begin with because there i think are still open descriptions and additions to the ontology that explain why it is that these macroscopic subjects such as ourselves become disassociated from the cosmic mind because to me at least from a conceivability perspective metaphysically it's conceivable that um that there is no disassociation it's conceivable no, right. that all there is is uh, a conscious mind and that no disassociation occurs and so I think that we are in need of giving an explanation for how that process occurs, why that process occurs, and how it actually produces the phenomenology of our experience. And so just in the same manner that like on a critique of some kind of physicalist thesis, we want to demand how it is that, for example, the hard problem is resolved, how it is that the phenomenology of our experience is explained in terms of purely physical primitives. I think the same types of problems are going to apply and same needs for explanation are going to apply to a form of idealism like Bernardo's. Um, well, right. I mean, I do, I mean, I haven't, I have looked into the, what's called a decombination problem and that's kind of where um, people will kind of, there's a lot of philosophers that kind of present that argument against cosmopsychism, for example. Um, and again, I think Bernardo does acknowledge that at least in, you know, he's me he's mentioned the fact that yes, it's true that under his model, at least particularly, you don't necessarily need um, disassociated alters, right? And that's why I kind of differ with him in the sense that I do think that the universal consciousness has awareness, like it's a God, right? So it will produce other minds from its from itself essentially so it'll use its own mental states to kind of create alters intentionally so that you know then you will have alters and that kind of explains why humans exist for example because under naturalism there you know you can't really there wouldn't be a prediction like yeah naturalism could explain why humans exist but it doesn't make that prediction in the same sort of way whereas something like my so are you worried yeah you worried there with that or are you um no yeah i'm worried about castrop's view specifically yeah yeah i well i guess that like to frame my concern about that and to try to draw back to that thread that i gave before um i think that you're actually adding quite a bit more to your ontology by positing such things than merely that consciousness is a primitive and so now when we thought, for example, that there might be some explanatory or theoretical virtue behind a metaphysics where consciousness is a primitive, I now start to have the worry that with this addition of more and more things uh, to give us our, you know, explanation of disassociated alters, that uh, maybe we're just, uh, you know, rehearsing the same kind of criticism of physicalism <laughs> that really like we're not giving ourselves anything better by doing this um well i mean under we, naturalism you wouldn't really predict that humans exist so whereas under you know theism you actually would predict that humans exist and they do exist so i mean you know it depends on how you approach it like because i know I richard goes back to hold on though i thought that we agreed at the beginning of the conversation that theism is a broad proper uh, a broad hypothesis space no and right well, that's that why no i agree with that yeah i'm just saying like specifically you know a theism that's more compatible with christian theism would predict that humans ex you know that conscious minds other than god exists right because if god's loving then he's going to create other beings and the mechanism by which he does that under my view would be disassociation so Right. But what I see that's occurred there is that you have posited a highly specific form of theism that's specifically tailored to give an expectation 
And I think that what you're not doing is accounting for how, by choosing a very narrow region of the hypothesis space, how that affects the prior probability of your theory. So on one, on one hand, you're trying to make the claim that my, that your theory, on the one hand, you're trying to make the claim that your theory, by virtue of having consciousness as fundamental, gives you some explanatory virtue because of the fact that consciousness would be, um, you know, fundamental. <laughs> so right. the, but then on the other hand, you're saying that the only way that we get there to explain human experience is by within a theistic hypothesis, choose a very, very narrow region of the hypothesis space. And that's where I think that we have difficulty because I can s select a really narrow region of the hypothesis space too. I can say that the uh, the original uh, vector of the you know Hilbert space uh, of our universe was one that had precisely uh, uh, precisely the necessary um, description to lead to a deterministic or sorry to deterministically evolve into uh, a world that had a planet going around the sun, which eventually evolved via nat natural selection, humans that have consciousness. Like, isn't, isn't anybody that... can do that. Like, well, we can, I can do that too. I can I can choose, like, a tiny region of the hypothesis space too and just say that, like, well, that's my explanation. But I don't feel like we get anywhere by doing that. Like, that's... Um, well, I mean, are you yeah, saying... Because under I, that model, it seemed like nature would be teal Sorry. To you, like it would have some sort of purpose rather than just being random, right? No, it just under happened to be in a configuration that would lead to human minds under its deterministic evolution. No, right, but if it's deterministic, it would have to be like teleological in some sense, right? I don't think so. I, I think that it just happens to, <laughs> I, I think it would just happen to, uh, it would just need to be in a particular state that would lead to us under the, okay. you know, cause of determinism. But, um, it's getting a, it's almost yeah. two hours. No, I know, I know. I was about to say, like, I gotta, I gotta go. But it was, was nice fun, talking Mark. to you. Yeah, I yeah, mean, and obviously, I, I, I really appreciate your perspective. And yeah, if I'm um, in any way uh, beating up on it, I'm. I, I only do that because I'm interested in this stuff too. And this whole process of trying to figure out what's true in the world is a passion of mine, as well as it clearly is yours. Right. And so I'm, I consider you and uh, Michael, even though, even though I have criticisms of him and Josh Rasmussen and Johan and Ratz and uh, Kastrop and uh, Henry Stapp and all these people, I consider you all comrades in the, Right, and the search of truth of figuring out what's true, and right. so I won't be. I, I, um, I like you for it, and I appreciate that. No, you right, have such I, I do, yeah, I like atheists like you that kind of will dialogue and not, you know, because my last conversation with Tom Jump was not very good. He just kept saying I was wrong, 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 whereas you seem to be way more open minded than he was. So I do appreciate, you know, the uh, dialogue and conversation. So yeah, well, I appreciate your views, and I love the fact that you uh, like in this project with me of trying to figure out what the heck's going on. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we're gonna end the broadcast now. Thanks. Thank you guys for watching. So. See everyone. Yep.